How's it going? So, I was asked by the University of Rochester to uh, talk to their uh, PhD students and their other students that are interested in XR. Uh, and they wanted me to speak about really interdisciplinary approaches to problem solving using emerging technology. And for many that don't know, uh, I have a Master of Arts in Interdisciplinary Studies, which means that it's a sort of a catch-all for many things, right? Um, it, I studied uh, fine arts, I studied exercise sports science, and I studied psychology, uh, all uh, through an interdisciplinary project where I, I made a graphic novel exploring the uh, problems with uh, the institution of uh, the NCAA for revenue generated sports, football and basketball, and how they disproportionately affect uh, black students in predominantly white institutions to where they're more likely to have success on the field than off the field. And that perpetuates a lot of stereotypes. And so from my approach in that background, you know, interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary approaches is really how I uh, utilize augmented reality to address some of the issues that I that I aim to address with my work, whether it's education, access, all those types of things. And so for me, you know, being a future medical student and uh, going down this path of social activism and, and social impact and also uh, representation and storytelling, uh, interdisciplinary studies and, uh, and approaches is, is where I uh, you know, I really value that aspect of my education and, and how I'm able to look through certain lenses. And so uh, this is the University of Rochester's uh, Voices of XR with me talking about interdisciplinary approaches to problem solving using emerging technology and hope you enjoy it. So uh, so my name is Steve. I am uh, I will be talking about interdisciplinary approaches to problem solving and uh, particularly with innovation in emerging tech and Interestingly enough, um, what I do is I consider myself a, a content creator. And so what I do is I um, just come up with ideas. I, uh, you know, do whatever process is required to manifest those ideas and put those out into the world. And uh, as a result, you know, it, it sort of opens up and creates more opportunities for myself and for others. And so a lot of it has been, uh, has been focused on uh, me personally sort of like rewriting the narrative of what um you know what uh young black men in america look like and, and do uh for me i guess i didn't really come up uh you know set myself up for success in that area because you know i sort of went the stereotypical route right like played football in my life and then that got me into college and then from there sort of like tried to go to the nfl then i got injured and then i was sort of sleeping on couches and stuff and so from there, it, it really forced me to start thinking outside the box uh, because, um, you know, I, in many ways, I was unhirable in, in a lot of different areas. And uh, and it, it was just it was just very bleak opportunities. And and so uh, from there, I just sort of had to just think about stuff and, and create. And uh, and from there, you know, it, it really sort of created I allowed it allowed me to create a career for myself. And so uh, and so in terms of like innovation, like I probably wouldn't be in the position that I'm at now if I didn't innovate, uh, because literally all the stuff that I'm doing now, uh, I joke around about with my girlfriend where all the stuff that I do now are just because I just came up with the idea and then I just sent out a cold, like a whole bunch of cold emails and then people just responded. And, you know, if people rejected me, then I just send another hundred emails out, you know, and, and that's just essentially how it worked. Uh, and so in many ways you have to be, uh, you just have to just sort of pursue ideas and, and, and wait for people to catch up to those ideas. And so what do I do, right? Like I am, and actually let me move this to the side. Okay, so people can still see that. Cool, yeah. So uh, so what I do is, um, you know, I am a retired football player. So I, I played football uh, for 12 years. I played six years in college. I also had two hip surgeries. And so I also overcame, uh, you know, debilitating injuries to continue playing, which probably isn't good for my health, but hey, what can you do? Uh, I'm also an animator, a college instructor, a STEAM educator. Uh, so science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. And, uh, math. Um, you could sort of, you know, put a slash math slash manufacturing 
because I because uh, I do a lot of um, production as well. Uh, comic creation. I'll be a medical student in fall, so that'll be interesting. Uh, youth mentor, writer, full stack augmented reality mobile developer is sort of the title that I took on last year uh, as I got deeper into uh, emerging tech. Uh, innovator, community builder, uh, podcaster. I'm a radio host. Uh, well, whenever you know we get back in the studio, web developer, and I also like snowboard and boogie board. And so, uh, and so those are like the things that I typically do on a regular basis. And, uh, and you know, the lines get very blurred when it comes to um, just the things that I uh, enjoy doing and, and can do. And so I really try to push the envelope of like what I'm capable of doing. And do, do, do. And so with the, you know, uh, many of people know me for the work that I've done over the past year. Uh, and that includes just, uh, you know, stuff in the arts, so, um, you know, using animation and trying to get to physical products that people can buy and actually, uh, you know, expand their reality of, of, you know, what is possible. Uh, and so that means just taking your phone and uh, unlocking unlockable stuff within art. Um, other things are just, you know, bringing characters to life and particularly black characters and allowing you to see them in a new way and hopefully identify with them uh, in a new way. And uh, using that to change your perspective of what Black creativity looks like. And then more importantly, I'm, you know, like many, you know, young Black millennials, the like dance culture and all those different things have, have influenced me in my life. And so I see that there's a lot of opportunities in that space to uh, show what is possible um, in the arts, in integrating technology into it. And so a lot of the stuff that I do as an artist is really focused on incorporating uh, technology and innovating. And so for me, I'm a problem solver. I, I develop skills you know, along the way to address specific problems. Um, many would say call that a generalist uh, and partly because you know, for my experiences, I've had to overcome obstacles without, with very little resources. And so, uh, you know, I would say that I'm a byproduct of the, essentially the internet generation where people were more likely to just Google something rather than uh, actually, you know, actually like talk to people. And, and, and from where I'm from, uh, the stuff that I was interested in, I actually could not talk to anybody to, uh, to explore the things that I wanted to explore, learn the things that I wanted to learn. And so because of that, I really had to, um, I really had to just look things up and, and build community online that goes beyond my geographic location. Uh, that, that means that one, you stand out, but also it becomes a solo journey uh, for many people where you're innovating and you're, and you're inspiring others, but the, the people that you look up to, uh, you, have, you can't physically you know, be in, in the same location as them. Uh, and I think, I think that just speaks volumes for just uh, you know, the nature of innovation and the nature of the work that like me and other people do, where there'll probably be one person in one city, one state, and then the next person will probably end up being in another country. And so over the past year, I see that like a lot of the conversations I have with people that I sort of look up to are in like Denmark and Green and you know, Greenland and places like that, which is pretty interesting, you know. I never thought I would be, you know, talking to people and building connections that way. Uh, but you know, such is life. And um and so what I do is I essentially, you know, because I have such a diverse array of experiences, what I do is I, I create solutions by pulling from those experiences. And so many of the solutions that I come up with are really just things that like uh, speak to me as a person personally. And so often you'll uh, come across and we'll, I'll sort of gloss on that later, but uh, the things that I would come up with, another person that sort of does the type of work that I do probably won't come up with that same solution. And it's just because it's very subjective. And so for me, it um, sort of, when I think about problem solving, I always look at it through the lens of interdisciplinary studies, uh, the concept of Afrofuturism, and then just the core concept of, of, of innovation. And so they, they overlap in many ways, but there's very distinct, um, there's very distinct sort of categories that these, these all sort of align with. And so innovation, you know, for the most part, uh, for those that uh, don't know what the actual definition of it is, 
uh, innovation is just taking an idea and then making it a practical reality. And so when you say, when people refer to innovation, uh, it's really just saying like, I had this idea and this is what I did with it to manifest something. And so, uh, and so I, I would argue that um, in order to be an innovator, you have to actually create something that uh, that's practical or tangible. Otherwise it's just an experiment. And you could say that like experiments are, you know, can be practical and stuff like that. But, uh, but from my experience, uh, the stuff that's experimental are the things that like still require innovation. And so uh, Afrofuturism, you know, Afrofuturism is something that like uh, me as a black person, I really appreciate and identify with, but it goes beyond just like my black identity. It, it really focuses on uh, imagining a future through a black cultural lens. And what that means is that uh, black cultural lenses uh, do not exclude black people from the innovations that black people have, uh, have had and made in society, uh, whether it be in the arts and technology, all those things. And so we're seeing a resurgence of like, you know, black history being more of a, being more mainstream uh, because black inventors have been uh, a pivotal in the advancements in American society. Uh, the problem is if you were look at history books, the only time you see black people is in slave movies and stuff. And so it's uh, and so Afrofuturism says, no, yes, there's slavery, but then post-slavery and in modern society, black people have contributed in these impactful ways. Or if you take out black people, you take out that innovation. Uh, and, and that's antithetical to, you know, what we're just sort of seeing right now uh, and um, or just what we've seen in the, in the past. And so, uh, and so Afrofuturism, you know, sort of asks this question of what if, you know, what if black people were never slaves? What if black people got reparations? What if black people got this? What if, uh, just addressing that what if encourages you to unchain your mind from, you know, what's happening right now and actually, you know, use speculative fiction and, and, um, and uh, just explore things in, in a different way, you know, expand your mind. And so I think that, um, you know, just the, the whole concept of Afrofuturism really encourage you to ask what if, and I think that uh, that really carries over into uh, how to approach interdisciplinary, uh, you know, how to approach something through an interdisciplinary lens. And, you know, how do you even start to like innovate or even want to innovate? And so with the, you know, innovations and in, in, in black people in this country are, uh, are nuanced and also pivotal, right? Like we we all know of Missy Elliott from all the music videos, but uh, what she did was she actually redefined what the identity of uh, blackness in pop culture was, where, you know, it used to be just, you know, shoot them up, bang, bang. And now you could actually talk about things and explore different ideas through sound and through costume design. You know, we all know Grace Jones, right? Like modern ideas of fashion, and sexuality and femininity and beauty uh, were, were redefined by like the work that she did, you know? And, and in many ways, when we're talking about technology, these ideas and the manifestation of those, those ideas and the power that those ideas have when they're manifested, that is the use of technology. And so it, often we think of like AR and VR and, you know, coding and all that, but culture is technology is, um, is one of the things that, uh, that really stands out and is actually really used. It's just not highlighted and glossed over um, as much as it should be. You know, we know Garrett Morgan, who essentially saw an idea and said, hey, you know, I saw this, uh, I witnessed this accident. You know, what if there was a warning sign, uh, you know, uh, on traffic lights to mitigate these accidents? You know, just exploring that what if organically and then creating something from it, innovating uh, from those ideas. And then Will I Am. Will I Am was one of the pivotal people that got me into the work that I'm doing, which is um, which is AR Comics. You know, he uh, he's you know works in sound. He does a lot of cultural stuff. He he's in, interested in technology. All he did was say, "What if I combined everything into a book format to get people to open up books and and identify with things uh, in a new way?" And so he created the first uh, first like mainstream graphic novel with Marvel. Um, you know, put an asterisk there because they didn't really market it the way that they could have uh, to, you know, sort of expand that. But, um, but the work that he did really inspired me because it shows that like, you know, a book has value beyond just the text and beyond just the pictures. You can actually experience it in, in, a, in an innovative way. 
Uh, and so, uh, you know, for for artists, particularly black artists, like I think a lot of the stuff that he does is uh, is really applicable to um, a lot of the things that we currently have access to. And so, you know, interdisciplinary approaches is a uh, is an interesting concept because it's really forcing you to um, approach things through a lens, a specific lens to address specific problems. And so what you do is you essentially pull from a variety of experiences that you have to develop a solution. And that solution is, is, is very subjective and it's very pertinent to the specific problem that you're trying to address. And so very, very likely that the problem that you have or the solution you came up with for one problem won't carry over to another one, but you can, you can take those insights to uh, develop another solution. And, and what that requires is essentially for you to think outside the box. And so I mentioned Afrofuturism and sort of uh, being antithetical or uh, an affront to Western beliefs in society. So what we, what we know as um, a society in America is that we tend to compartmentalize things, right? Uh, and the big thing is talking about like work-life balance, where we have our work life, we have our home life, we have our social life. Those are all just boxes that we're compartmentalizing things in. Uh, when we're dealing with problems, problems don't care about boxes. They could care less about any of that stuff, right? Like they just exist, they manifest, they perpetuate disparities. And so the, the idea that we have a box for education, our family, our art, math, science, sports, friends, you know, science, like all those things, um, interdisciplinary approaches means take rid of those boxes and just put those in a and put those in a list, and so you prioritize what those things are to you, and then you pull from those experiences to to solve that problem. So some things require you to have a background in education. Maybe you like science, and this one thing that you just do as a scientist, you can approach with your art. You know, if you for me, I'm very formulaic, and so even though I approach things creatively. I like to have formulas, and so my math background really influences how uh, how efficient I am with my art and my creative practice, uh, and so that could actually create a lot of different things. And uh, and I think that carries over to my comics. It carries over into the business that I have focused on making comics, and uh, and then eventually, you know, I'm able to connect with my friends because I do the work that I do. And so it's it's a very nuanced way to bridge the gaps between all your different boxes to where there aren't boxes. It's just a, a summation of you as a whole. And I think that this uh, this really speaks to sort of the, the trend to go look at things holistically. Um, and so you could say that essentially like Afrofuturism and, and interdisciplinary studies is just a way to approach things holistically rather than um, rather than in sort of compartments, uh, compartments that we sort of that force us to stress ourselves out a lot more than we probably should. And so, uh, and so what do these things have to do with like problem solving, right? Like, um, you know, problems that we have, they're, they're really nuanced and, and they have, uh, they perpetuate disparities. And sometimes you, you really need to think out the box, outside the box to just come up with those solutions. But more importantly, um, you know, like these solutions that, there are these problems that you we're experiencing, we have life experiences and stories that go along with defining what that problem is. And so what those life experiences uh, come insights into why those problems exist. And the big thing is why those problems exist. Because when a problem is perpetuated, it's, it's because we don't, uh, we don't have a solution that addresses the why. And, uh, and so uh, for a variety of things like your skills, your hobbies, you know, all the things that, you're, that uh, you know, make up your interests that even go beyond just your profession or your major, uh, those are things that also have value, and those are the things that get you over that hump to address the why. And so, for me, because I'm sort of formal, formulaic in things, it's uh, I like to try to figure out approaches to things. And so, uh, to ab approach something uh, through an interdisciplinary lens, you essentially, you know, you notice a problem that persists, and it's often something that you know have a personal experience uh, to. And then you uh, reflect and explore that idea uh, for because you have a personal connection to it and you have a background uh, that that relates to it. And um, you know, the things that lead to your experiences, the things that you that you notice, 
are the things that lead you to the why and give you those insights. And so because you live the life that you live and you sort of exist with that problem, uh, you have a personal connection to it and you also are just close to it. It's really hard for you to take a step back from it. And so the so the things that you notice are going to be the things that uh, that make the the power of an interdisciplinary approach more impactful to coming up with a solution. And this goes beyond this goes beyond just technology. Uh, I mean, it gets it goes beyond technology. It goes beyond everything. But this is a you know your connection to the problem is what uh, is what allows you to innovate in those areas. And uh, and so you know the 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 thing is that people are able to recognize the problem and people are able to define the problem and they may they may be able to to notice the why but the problem is that people don't often pull from successful approaches that they had in other areas of their life and so what they they will sort of shut down and say like okay the stuff that I did at work does not apply to me at home and the stuff that I do at home doesn't apply to me at work uh, when that can't be, you know, farther from the farther from the truth, and so, you know, what you when you start to pull and be open to pulling from those successful approaches that you have in other areas into the problems that are into the areas that have problems, then that's where you start to that's where you start to you know address the solutions and, and come up with solutions, and so uh, once you start once you start to be open to that, then it's really just coming up with that what if you know creating a hypothesis. Uh, it could be informal or formal. I do a lot of informal stuff, um, but coming up with a hypothesis, putting it on paper, and uh, and then just testing the approach out, and uh, and then documenting and sharing it. You know, because that I think that piece in and of itself of documentation and sharing it, whether it's a YouTube video or a blog post, um, or just a conversation with somebody, like those things are the things that really get it to the next step. And uh, and and that furthers the innovation because you're allowed to you're able to build a community, and so often you're not only approaching things and, and exploring things that you have interest in and that you're passionate about, but you're also building a, a team of collaborators to help you explore that even further. And so uh, and so essentially you be, you use um, you know people with resources as well, and that's just a skill that people naturally develop as they. Uh, try to address problems in these particular areas. And so, you know, I have a formula, patent pending, uh, which is sort of the problem, something that you notice, the connection, you know, the personal story connected to that problem, the insights that you have. So from experiencing the problem firsthand over time, uh, and then accomplishment. So the process you use to be successful in other areas of life. And then from there, you just explore that what if. And so that the all the the four things prior to the what if are just the foundation that is laid, and then the what if that you come up with is is sort of building on that. So you'll just have a pillar of what ifs in this area, and in another area, and another area, but it's still that same sort of formula that you approach with. And so the the misconceptions of interdisciplinary approaches, though, is that. Um, you know, you often aren't inventing things. You like an innovator, it, an innovator can be an inventor, but an innovator doesn't have to be an inventor. Uh, you're often just redefining how things are used and how, they, how, how, you, how you approach things. And that's, uh, I think that really rings true for the work that I do where I don't feel like I've done anything different or I don't think that I've done anything, you know, sort of life-changing. I've just used other tools from other areas and incorporated in an area that just didn't see value in it. And so that's my area of innovation. I just, I call it kit bashing, where you just sort of take things from other things. Uh, that's what they used to do to uh, make all like the spaceships and stuff for Star Wars. Uh, and so they just sort of take stuff from like different model kits and then you just like make something new from it. Uh, and, uh, and then that the manifestation of something new is just the idea. It's not necessarily that, that like unique tangible product. And so, um, and so this is, you know, it's, it's completely subjective, you know, don't think that it, it's uh, this approach or the, the solutions you come up with are, are things that can be widely uh, adopted. Uh, they're typically very pertinent for the, the area and industry that you're addressing. Um, and so they could, um, and, and I think that because it's so subjective, it provides for a very authentic and unique, unique approach because it, 
uh, encapsulates your interests, your experiences, your expertise, and it's something that like only you can do in many in many areas, and uh, and it will be really hard to sort of replicate that if you, uh, you know, you could train it, but it's really hard to replicate that that specific approach that you would take. Um, and I think that just speaks to just a lot of us as as professionals and and academics and creators in general, where you give 20 people a prompt and they'll come up with 20 different, 20 different variations of it. And so for me, you know, I'm an athlete, a visual artist and educator. And so for me, like my approach is democratizing, uh, you know, barriers that have excluded black communities from having access to resources and information. And so, uh, and so that lends me to exploring things through a community-based approach uh, that is scalable. Um, but if you're not an artist, you're not black, you're not an athlete, you'll have a different approach to these problems. And so, uh, and so that's how you'll sort of see varying degrees of it. Um, and, and so that's why it becomes so subjective because I have a personal experience and I have personal expertise, then, uh, then it lends to a, a, a different result than what, you know, somebody that doesn't look like me or doesn't have the same expertise as me would have. And so with that, I mean, there's no right way to do, you know, to approach a problem, but there is a way for you to approach a problem and find a solution. And I guess I should have like underlined and, and bolded and capitalized you because like that is, uh, it's really focused on like you as a person and as a creator and as somebody that's assault addressing a problem. Um, and, and, and that's just because like you have a personal experience with it and it's authentic and it's something that has impacted your life. I would argue that it's really hard for you to approach a problem authentically through an interdisciplinary approach. If you don't have a personal connection to it. Um, and so I think that um, there's ways around that, but it's really difficult because you can't remove the person from the, from the problem solving, if that makes sense. And then more importantly, like, you have to, you have to be open to exploring new possibilities, right? Like you could be the best person for uh, addressing the problem. But if you are still trying to compartmentalize the, the approach, the, you know, the areas in which you want to integrate for the approach, then, uh, then often, you know, that you're shooting yourself in the foot in many ways. And uh, you don't want to do that either. <laughs> and so, you know, for me, uh, I sort of see life as just, uh, you know, um, an area that's full of problems that are just looking for solutions. And I think that rings true for a lot of people. And if you've just been paying attention to all this stuff in COVID, literally life just says, here's a problem, figure out a solution for it, right? Like that, that's pretty much how it works. And so from there, uh, it, for me, I've just sort of navigated uh, my life in the, in the past five, six years, uh, trying to address problems and then using those problems as, as learning experiences to uh to inform my next you know area or you know approach you know opportunities in life and so you know my first problem that i explored uh, uh i was a football player i had two hip surgeries and then i ended up uh returning back to football but prior to that i got to explore um art as a as sort of a creative creative avenue uh, I was a big fan of the boondocks. And so I essentially just wanted to recreate the boondocks. And um, I quickly learned that being an animator is definitely a tumultuous thing. And it's not something you could just learn in a couple of months. And, uh, but what I did is I learned how to make comics and I learned how to express myself visually. Um, so when I returned to the football field, um, I ended up getting into a, a master's program at Oregon State. And so I was a, a two years to play um, college football. And I also had, um, I essentially was a grad student. And so I was one of the very unique, uh, fortunate and unique people in, uh, in the NCAA when I was playing to um, essentially be going after a master's degree and also going after the NFL at the same time. And so, uh, and so with that, I, I saw that, you know, because I stood out, I, I, you know, stood out in many areas and I was the only, often the only black person often the only athlete in a lot of the classes and in conversations that I was having. And, um, and then I was sort of confronted with that stereotype of like what a black athlete looks like and what, and what they do uh, at schools, particularly, particularly uh, predominantly white schools. And so for me, I just sort of looking at like, you know, why is it that um, black athletes in revenue generated sports, so football and basketball 
are more likely to succeed on the field and go to the NFL, but they're less likely to go into graduate programs. And so, uh, and so my connection was to it was I was a division one athlete at a uh, predominantly white institution. And uh, the experiences that I had hindered me from navigating both in a seamless way. And so uh, the insights that I had was that I played college football for six, or six years and I went to two different schools playing and I was also a grad student. So I, I, ex- I, lived, those, I lived those actual experiences that I was trying to see in other people. And, um, and then those accomplishments that I had were uh, hip surgery and playing football. And you know, then because of our, I had like popular YouTube videos and stuff like that, which created other problems because of the NCAA. But uh, but it, it it allowed me to sort of branch out into other ways. And so my what if was really uh, I didn't really know what a what if was. And so this is what I was really exploring for the, you know, for my time at Oregon State. And and from that, uh, my grad, I also say that, like, my graduate program was an interdisciplinary studies graduate program. And we we're also trying to figure out what interdisciplinary studies was. And so I remember the second, like my fourth or fifth term. We were still sitting in class like we don't know what the heck this is, but we'll but we'll just keep doing it, right? And so uh, and so from there, I came up with some solutions, and those solutions were varied, and they really spoke to the uh, the things that like I was interested in and was able to create. And so first, I created a graphic novel called No Love for Gladiators, put it on Kickstarter, you know, was able to self publish it. From there, I uh, I ended up working on a documentary called The Business of Amateurs which essentially is like my graph, the topics in my graphic novel, but exploring it through, uh, through a long form storytelling. And so like a two, three hour documentary. Um, and then from there, because I was in animation, I made a two, a two minute like animated sequence that sort of talked about just the, the, the pipeline that athletes go through just to get through the system and then just get thrown away at the end. Um, and so what happened with that is just working on those three things sort of one after another um, ended up getting featured on uh, on last week tonight with John Oliver. So if anybody like goes to his like NCAA rant, um, just type in John Oliver NCAA, uh, you'll see that like my documentary was referenced and stuff like that. So got some like HBO credits from that, and then uh, and then I also spoke to um, went on a speaking engagements and stuff. So start I spoke to my court uh, my old. I apologize. There's a train that likes to be obnoxious during uh, tumultuous times in my life. And so uh, <laughs> uh, try to disregard that. But um, I spoke on uh, many things that uh, at different colleges about just like what it's like to be an athlete and going beyond what those stereotypes are. And so with it, you know, like many of the things that I created really just like built on themselves naturally. And it's not it's not really things I sort of like hope to it's just interesting, like they all just sort of happened organically. I didn't really seek them out specifically, but I uh, sought out the idea of a solution and, and tried to address it the, and, and became open to different possibilities. And so another one that I had was, you know, when I finished playing, I was like, man, you know, like representation for, uh, you know, in cartoons and comics just wasn't there for uh, in terms of black representation. And so, you know, I, I didn't see a lot of stuff that I, I grew up with on, on screen anymore. And, uh, but I knew that like people like me wanted to see themselves in their popular characters. So I knew that like my creative works really uh, can spark conversations. And so what I did is I created this series called Black Superheroes Matter or Black Heroes Matter. And, uh, and uh, just took my favorite cartoon characters, favorite heroes and redefined them through children of color. Uh, that ended up, you know, getting waves and, you know, a whole bunch of different things happening at like Comic-Con in terms of representation. Uh, but when I started this project, like there wasn't anything out, right? Like there wasn't Black Panther. There wasn't any of these things to to uh, to go against the narrative that Black representation doesn't matter. And so, uh, and so from there, I ended up being the first person to like publish stuff under that banner. And then sort of the whole uh, wave of creators and blurs and all that sort of followed after that. And so it's that's that's been a very interesting uh, thing, and more importantly, it's 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 using uh, it's really using culture as a as a technology to address certain problems. And so often the the technology that you use uh, doesn't even doesn't even need to have x you know ones and zeros. It could just be just the ideas and the manifestation of the ideas and the processes which you approach things. And um, 
And so for me, you know, like, because I'm going to medical school, uh, one of the things that was trending, obviously, because of last year and, and what's happening now is the disparities of Black patients in, uh, in the field of medicine. And that's because there's not a lot of, uh, you know, the, the problems that we see are just based on just disparities and, you know, white supremacy in many ways. And so, uh, and so one of the problems that I'm sort of aware of, and hopefully many of you are aware of, is that, you know, medical students and residents, which lead on to be doctors, believe inaccurate things about Black patients. And so, you know, that could be just Black people age slower than whites. You know, Black people's blood coagulates more quickly. Whites have larger brains. Uh, blacks have thicker skin. Um, you know, Black people have stronger immune systems. Uh, and all these different things that perpetuate the, the problems that we see in uh, lack of equitable care. And so for me, uh, that when, when I have navigated these spaces, often I'm the only Black person in that space. And because I'm the only Black person, I have to actually, you know, share and talk about things and, and explain things in a unique way. And so what I do is, um, you know, my what if was, what if I created an experiences to uh, for people to learn about black bodies and and see that they aren't any different. And so what I did is I essentially created um, I created an AR experience. And so this is a way for me to uh, not only be able to put a black person in the home of somebody, somebody with darker skin, but also allow you to uh, peel away the layers of the skin to go down to uh, to the bones go down to the brain, go down to all these different things and, and literally see that black people are no different. Um, and you could scale it up, you could gamify it, you could do all these different things. But the, but the beauty of it is that, um, you know, this, is, this can be a very personal way to explore um, these various topics without having to, you know, be essentially without having to subject yourselves to the, you know, the public realities, right? Like you, you peel away some, you know, uh, a black model skin and you're able to explore it and investigate it in ways that, that uh, provide for very deep connections. And, and immersive technology in many ways has the power to do that because, uh, because one, there's a sort of flashy allure to it, uh, but in more importantly, like these are actually engaging things. You actually have to take, have to take specific actions to, uh, to get an end result. And if you don't take those actions, then you won't get the insights that come from those actions. So I think I'll fast forward it because because uh, one of the things that I really enjoy is uh, let me see if I yeah. So one of the things that I really enjoy is animation, and so uh, being able to open up the skull and do that like in in mixed reality like that was just fun. I was just like I can incorporate animation. I can incorporate 3D models. I can incorporate user experiences. I can incorporate game mechanics, uh, but that's just because I have the background in it, right? And so, uh, and so, because I learned all that stuff to address that very specific problem and create that experience, I can now I have the skills and I can do other stuff with it. But the journey of approaching that problem naturally and organically, I didn't set out to learn how to code. I set out to solve a problem. And bought through that problem, I learned how to code. I learned how to build all these different things and create that experience. And I think that that's that's something that we do foundationally in school, but it's not uh, explicitly expressed in that way. Uh, and so, because it's not explicitly expressed in that way, if you just start, you know, go for an angle and then start to pick up new skills along the way, you tend to just pick up skills and then compartmentalize that, and then you have to untrain yourself to use those skills in other areas. Uh, this is just sort of flipping it on its head to where like you don't need to know everything you just need to know enough to just get the get the job done and uh and that's what the problems care about the problems care about just finding a solution not necessarily how you found it just that it exists and it makes sense and so another one is uh just the fact that um you know uh black children often fear uh, below the reading level, and that uh, perpetuates a lot of the things that we see in disparities in, in education. And uh, and for me, my connection to that was, I remember in uh, in tenth grade, my English teacher said that we had to have book reports, and I dreaded that because I just avoid reading because I I uh, was nervous every time I read and read in public, 
And uh, it was just something that like was really hard to get over until he introduced me to, um, to graphic novels. And that really opened the doors to like what reading was for me. And so those insights that I had was that like, I know many black people that don't like picking up books, but they will watch, they will watch, you know, Japanese anime and read the mess out of some, you know, some subtitles. And so they'll read, they have the capacity to read and they will read. It's just that you have to frame it in a different way. And so what if, uh, so for me, what if I created books that allowed, uh, essentially, you know, what if I created books that allowed you to have that experience of, of motion and everything that's attractive, but at the end of the day, you're able to, um, you know, essentially read subtitles and essentially read subtitles of a book. So what if you watched a book, right? And what if you're able to interact with it and stuff like that to where at the end of the day, you are, you know, able to essentially have the, the words pop off the page and, and listen with sound and, and see it with motion. And so the idea that I essentially explored was, you know, taking a book and, and letting it come to life with, um, with sound and motion so that you can watch it, you can read it, you can listen to it, and you could even interact with the characters and, and play with it. And so that, that not only adds value to the book, which in, then in turn has more black kids picking up books rather than turning on a TV screen because they could have a better experience with a book than a TV screen. And again, like this is all stuff that, you know, you know, stems from a lot of the work that I've already done. And then uh, obviously um, what people are calling the Portland experiment, which is, uh, which is essentially, um, you know, me taking uh, during like the, during the summertime, uh, me taking a, like a, a 3D model of George Floyd and then going to create an AR experience, an AR app, and then going to, um, uh, like just many hotspots around Portland during uh, during like the heat of the moment and actually going through and uh, ins doing like 30 foot installations of, of that bust in, in hotspots and then taking pictures and videos. And so what I did with that is the reason I chose, the reason I approached it that way is because one, you know, the feds were out here and they were like snatching people up like five blocks away from me. And so that was like super scary to do. Um, Two, I'm black in Portland, so like all those things that are happening with me, I want to be able to participate. Uh, but I also am trying to go into medical school, so I can't get arrested. And there are many people getting arrested. And uh, and then three, I did not want to get sick. You know, I uh, you know I grew up with a lung infection for like 12 years of my life, and so when I heard that you know some of the symptoms were like pneumonia, uh, that was the last thing I wanted to do because I thought that I like got over that. Um, and so I know I'll be subjected to that type of stuff. And so, uh, the goal for me in this situation was how can I, how can I make something that's impactful, make something that ex allows me to explore my creativity and allows me to, uh, leave an impact. And interestingly enough, the, the movement that we saw last year probably would not have existed to the way that it did if we didn't have smartphones. And so I saw that the power of a smartphone because most of us saw the videos and everything through Twitter, through YouTube, through, through our phones. And so you, if you harness the power of the phone and you create these experiences and you share those with the world, then they'll share those and they will, they will see that those things actually existed. And so I didn't have to go through to do the, all the, all I needed was a computer and idea, you know, with, uh, with the, if I would have had to make a 30 foot statue, uh, and install it, I would have had to get a permit, I would have had to like navigate just like, you know, racist institutions, I would have had to like duck and dodge the port, the, the proud boys, I would have had to do all those different things just to get that experience only to probably have it getting taken down like 30 seconds later. And so with this, this lives on forever and nobody could do anything to it because it's not tangible, but it still exists because there's pictures and videos of it. And there's people walking around it and interacting with it. And so for, uh, so the power of technology in this area was really insightful because I posted those pictures online. The worst thing somebody could have said was, oh, I hate it. Or they'll say some, you know, racist joke about George Floyd, but that's it. They couldn't do anything about it. Right. Like that. And, and that's the power of it. It allows you to mitigate those realities that, uh, that are associated and have been associated with this expressing things about uh, the plight of black Americans. And so, uh, and so this, you know, this experience really uh, showed me how you can democratize ideas and, and activism 
in ways that uh, that de essentially decentralize things. And so you could take away my computer, you could you could take away you know my access to the internet, but you can't take you can't take away the the pictures and stuff that exist on the internet. You know, like God forbid it goes on the blockchain, then it's on forever, right? Like it's and and that's the power of innovation is is being able to address problems that uh, that have very real consequences and mitigating those consequences by uh, by taking nuanced and interdisciplinary approaches, right? Like this project required me to know how to find stuff on the internet. It required me to you know know how to build an AR app. It required me to learn how to do a little bit of code maybe some 3d modeling but at the end of the day like i didn't go i didn't want to just make 3d models i wanted to create an experience and that experience is, was to address a specific problem and uh and so from there i i started to explore just innovations and in storytelling about black issues and so what that meant is i wanted to express myself and uh express myself in books and and use those books to sort of harness the power of creativity and harness the media in it. And so the way uh, AR works and the way, yeah, the way AR works, at least, um, you know, in the work that I do, like I create images and then, uh, and then those images essentially act as QR codes uh, so that I can parent animation and other digital assets to it. And so because the images are unique in nature, the uh, I'm able to have a essentially have a picture be a QR code for a collection of different things, and so what I did is I just made a whole magazine full of uh, full of uh, QR code based illustrations and and pages, and then I had unique experiences that go from one page to the next, and so it was a matter of just the book cover saying that Black Lives Matter and people sort of chanting, and bringing that sort of like group community crowd uh, activism. Uh, thing to literally like your, you know, the palm of your hand. And then also talking about uh, animation, how, um, you know, uh, different institutions perpetuated a lot of things that affected black and brown communities uh, during COVID. And, uh, and, you know, even from there, like even to the point where uh, I created a, a 3D model of, um, of the editor who, who's part of this uh, black owned company. And you could just walk in the, walk in the shoes of the anim of the editor you know, as a black man in America by uh, using using AR, you know, with a 3D model and, and game mechanics and stuff. And so it, it, it's really allowed you to explore these things and innovate just because you're just trying to see like, what if, you know, what if I just did this, you know, what would that look like? What would that approach be? And so for me, it, it's, you know, animation and like, for me, AR and technology is a way for me to share animation that goes beyond just getting a movie deal or making a YouTube video. It's about it's about uh, adding motion and sound and bringing life to ideas that uh, that you can engage with with more than one sense. And so for me, you know, like that, my whole thing is just going out in the world and just like creating opportunities to overcome adversity. And hopefully through overcoming that adversity, you're able to, to conquer those things that have often hindered uh, people, you know, that are in the margins from, you know, just living their best lives. And so, uh, and so hopefully this, uh, hopefully this was insightful. Hopefully this helped. Uh, hopefully I was able to give you a little bit of a journey uh, of the, of the stuff that I do. And, um, you know, hopefully like you follow along with the stuff that I'm continuing to continue to do or, sharing the stuff that you're doing because uh you know for me I, i'm i'm always on twitter i'm always on all these things to uh to learn from others and uh and i think just sort of having that having that community mindset is what really gets us through all these things and so um and so the idea of like trade secrets and all that within reason right like trade secrets uh for ideas and approaches are uh are are things that should be democratized uh because that's how how things you know get better Thank you so much, Stephen. Um, that was awesome. Uh, I'd like to take some questions now. You're either welcome to unmute yourself and ask, um, or you can also put them in the chat and we will read them.
So did you say your background in uh, college was animation? Nope. I literally learned how to animate after I had my second, after I had my second hip surgery. So uh, I am a byproduct of YouTube University. Yeah, my question was how to teach yourself uh, the skills to just start doing things with AR or VR, things like that, especially if you don't have a background in animation. Yeah, it, it's a, uh, and that's, that's a, that's one thing that I always sort of go down these rabbit holes with, um, especially last year, because I had just the time. And so, uh, so for those that had the time, it's really um, one, finding people that are like doing things that you want to know how to do and, and just talking to them and just sort of picking their brain. Uh, and then the second thing is just a quick Google search on YouTube of just how to animate or how to do AR. Uh, that has gone, that has gotten me a lot further than, um, than any sort of approach that I've ever taken. And so, uh, and so with, um, with comics and animation, what the, the thing that I did is I went to Borders Books when that existed. And, um, and I got this book called uh, How to Animate for Teens. And I just read that book and did everything that that book said do. And then from there, uh, it gave me the confidence to just start experimenting with things. And so I would say that if you're looking to be efficient with your time, um, take a course because it will give you the direction, uh, more of a direction from an expert. But if you're just looking to explore and see where it goes, just just go down just a, a bunch of rabbit holes, you know, and just uh, and just try to just make little milestones here and there. Cool, thank you. Um, I have a question. I relate a lot to the sort of multidisciplinary aspect of your talk. Um, my question is about how do you avoid spreading yourself too thin if you have a lot of different ideas in a lot of different areas? How do you avoid that sort of thing? Yeah, so, um, so that is something that I struggle with on a regular basis. I think uh, this is my board of processes and ideas right there. And so uh, whenever I'm in like a Zoom call, that's always in the background. And so people are always curious to see like what, why I do that. And that is to, and that is to manage what I need to prioritize. Um, and so that's why I said, you know, trying to putting things in boxes really causes a lot of stress because it doesn't allow you to step outside and, and just think about things holistically. Uh, Cause many, in many areas of, I think, you know, particularly for like my AR work, the AR portion of my work probably takes like 30 minutes to do. The, 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 cr the other elements of it take days, if not weeks, if not years, right? Like the book that I worked on, I worked on that for a whole year, but the AR part of it, I put that together in like two weeks, you know? And so, uh, and so, but, but that's just because you have to prioritize what the real things are needed for the problem. Um, and so I, I, I would say um, there's, there's a way to look at things as a, from a multidisciplinary approach, but that multidisciplinary approach is just saying, I have a whole bunch of boxes here that I could do things in. An interdisciplinary approach says I have, a list of things, a list of variety of skills that I could pull from. And so it doesn't have boxes in interdisciplinary approaches, but it does have boxes in multidisciplinary approaches. And so, um, and so for me as a, me as a, a creator, uh, I found that it's really difficult to find a job, you know, if I just want to work for somebody, because it'll be like, what do you do and how can you help us? And it's like, well, I could do a whole bunch of things. What is the problem? And that doesn't really work well when you're trying to get a job where they're just like, you know, like they, they you, you want to be more specific with it. And so, um, and so it, it's a, you know, good luck, good luck on the journey <laughs> because it, it's a, it, it can be frustrating. And, uh, and my girlfriend can attest to how frustrated I'll be, I will become uh, if, uh, in certain situations. Thank you. Wonder if I can go next, maybe. Stephen, thank you so much. This was such an insightful talk. There were many things that will uh, 
stick in my mind. I mean, I love the way how you define Afrofuturism, interdisciplinary and innovation, and then related them. I also love the what if question. That's to me, that's a question of hope, especially in difficult times and for difficult problems. Thank you for all of that. I also like your formulaic approach. I'm an engineer. I like to formulate things and how you define the problem. But one of the aspects I wanted to ask about is you formulated this essentially from a personal standpoint. Um, and But one of the things we are actually um, trying to work with our students is things like teamwork and collaboration. So in your mind, how does that play into problem solving? Uh, do you, can you share experiences where collaboration and teamwork worked well or did not work well? And what are your recommendations to our students on that aspect? Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, I would say teamwork is is that I always I always use teamwork and community uh, interchangeably, and so anything that I mention when it comes to community, that's essentially referencing teamwork, uh, because that ultimately says that one person has the capacity to do a lot of things, but they don't have the capacity to do everything, and so uh, and so I always try to uh, get get the ball rolling. And then, and then I try to find collaborators to uh, to help me with these things that would often take me weeks, if not years, to to complete. Uh, somebody that has been working in uh, as a sound designer uh, for for thirty years will be a lot more efficient in in working with sound than me, who has to learn some YouTube videos to to stitch some stuff together. And so uh, I, I I forgot to put the the slut, one of the projects that I had in uh, in the deck. But I finished an, an AR mural in uh, in Portland for this nonprofit called Self Enhancement Incorporated, and the goal for, the goal that they wanted was they wanted to create. Uh, they had this mural, this like twenty foot mural of uh, six black uh, inventors that have influenced uh, modern day society, and they made they turned them into sort of superheroes. So it was sort of a a Black History superhero sort of mural, right? And, uh, and what they wanted to do was they wanted to uh, enhance or uh, incorporate, um, you know, make the experience more immersive. And so they wanted to have sound, they wanted to have voiceovers of like the actual characters and what they did so that they share the backstories. Uh, they also wanted to have some like, you know, visualization of their actual superpowers. Um, and they wanted to uh, just create, sort of create this well-rounded experience that um that stayed that attached to the actual like physical mural so you actually had to go to the mural to actually experience this opposed to just sending a v video out right um and so and so it creates a unique experience that like is more impactful and you'll remember the things from it uh because of just a, a variety of different things that they have they've done a lot of studies on but um but what i did is i i started in terms of like black creators or black blackness in ar in portland I started that, right? Like from the stuff that I did in, in back over the summertime, I sort of made, uh, I set the, I laid the groundwork to say like, oh, okay, if you want to explore blackness with AR, you can't, uh, and, uh, and I could help you do that. And so I sort of laid the groundwork for that, which allowed them to sort of start to think about that as a team. And so when they reached out to me, uh, they, they said, we have sound design, we have this vision, we want to do this. We want to work with you to to bring all that together uh, for the community, and so I ended up working with the the illustrator that did the mural uh, to help sort of come up with the ideas. Uh, I worked with two sound designers and a producer to uh, to work with like the sound so that there was a back a, a soundtrack and also uh, a writer that told the that allowed them to tell the stories and a uh, and a narrator that uh, was also one of the producers. And then, uh, and then we also work with like some community creators to actually in re like install another mural on the side of the building, uh, so that people can actually go to the building in multiple locations to have that experience. And so, uh, and so I think it was a team of like ten or eleven. Um, at the end of the day, like I was still responsible for like you know it coming together and coming into life, but um, but being able to delegate and collaborate with other people to to make the experience unique. Uh, that was just a byproduct of teamwork. You know, so the innovation came from showing people that this is a possibility. And then the the collaboration, the teamwork is is making that product and making that product come to life in the real world for others to experience. And so um, and so often for me, like 
I'm always looking to work with other people. It just so happens that like, I only know, I don't know many people that like can, can do the things that like I, I, I want to do, but whenever I do, um, I'm always hitting them up saying like, Hey, this would be great in AR. Hey, we should do this or explore these different things. Hey, let's collaborate on a project. I'm always doing that. And, uh, and it's because, um, I think that makes for lasting and impactful work that inspires other people to do more lasting and impactful work. Thank you. I have a question about uh, challenges that you encounter in uh, trying to integrate art and technology and trying to make a living out of uh, your, your activity. Can you talk a little bit about that, especially thinking of people who may want to follow in your footsteps? Yeah, yeah. So um, uh, my girlfriend will attest to the fact that uh, I have very, very difficult time, time valuing or putting value to the work that I do. Um, and so uh, and I think it irritates her more because I spend a whole lot of time working on things. And, uh, and that doesn't translate to actual dollars sometimes. Um, but uh, I think that it is a it is a conversation for me as a creator. It's a conversation of um, what value do what value do I think other people see in the work that I do, and uh, and so it's it's until I get until I address that question of like one do people even find value in this work? Or am I just doing this for therapy? That uh that that is something that you have to address first because if you're doing something for therapy, you don't care like you don't care what the value the value is what you what you uh, what it does for you. But, uh, but when you're uh, doing sort of work that's public facing, doing stuff for a career, you have to see like, what are the skills that, that people are actually paying me for? And what is the value of the creative work that, that comes from those skills? And, um, and I, I think every project that I do, um, uh, in one way or another, like every project that I do is a, is a way for me to love what my creative skills and with that, every project that I complete means that my price goes up uh, for for that particular area. And so, um, and so, it's I think figure out what you need to do to pay bills, and then from there, see how far you can push the envelope. And then for those experimental projects, just reach out to people that uh, reach out to people for speculative things. Um, perfect example is I there's this company or this a uh, pizza place that I love in Portland called Sizzle Pie. And so I created these, I created the AR mural and I created a whole bunch of different videos. And I said, hey, you know, like I, from that I have an idea of like how much it's gonna cost for me to like recreate that stuff. And then I just essentially just made a little like one sheeter and, and sent it to them and said, hey, I think that, you know, the, this project that I just completed, I think, uh, you know, looking at this, let me know what you think. And if you, if you want me to want to collaborate on something like this, uh, let's, let's set up a time to chat. And, uh, and then from there, you, it allows you to, um, when you have something that they can reference that, that shows that you have the possibilities for it, which gets their, their mind rolling. And then from there, you'll see if they're really interested in it, then that will allow you to possibly pay more bills, right. And, and get more pub and, and, and get more stuff. And so, uh, and so it, it, in a roundabout way, it, it's, you know, create stuff, put yourself out there. Don't think that it's going to happen overnight, but you can be strategic in how you, how you position your projects um, to where many of you probably don't know that I've only been in the AR space for 15 months. You know, I started December, 2019. That, uh, that is when I first opened up Unity. That's when I first uh, put out my first app. Uh, well, no, I did my first test. Uh, I put out my first app uh, January, 2020. And then I put out the second version of the app uh, in March, 2020. And then I released my second app in September, 2020. And so it's like, I'm fresh to the scene, but what I've, what I've done is I've approached things strategically because I, the things that I learned from football is that you 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 put things on tape, you do things in a game, you put them on tape, and then you send them to schools. And then if people like what they see on tape, then they'll reach out to you with opportunities. And so uh, and so, just approaching it that way, it's like I have no problem just saying like, oh yeah, I worked on this project, and I'll share it with a hundred people. 
And then if, you know, 30 people say, oh yeah, stop sharing it with me, then I'll just find another hundred people to share it with. And then, and then you just kind of go from there. And, uh, and then, uh, and so, uh, but really it's a matter of like, are you, are you doing something that you think other people would have value in? Or are you doing something that is just for you for therapy? And, uh, and they could be both, right? Like there's plenty of projects that I get stressed out about and it's like, I'm going to just do this and just play around with it just because it just makes me feel good. Right. And then uh, hopefully you can make some money off of it. <laughs> Hi, Stephen. Uh, yeah, thanks again. This is a really, really neat uh, perspective. Thanks for your talk. Um, so really quick, a uh, couple specifics on your uh, project that you did in Portland. Um, what was the platform the others could uh, view your stuff through? Was it uh, just through smartphones and apps or were there like headsets that were provided in some way? Um, and then along the lines of uh, AR headsets, that's tech I'm interested in uh, working on. Uh, what things, like, what would make it more useful uh, for content creators? Like what are, what are things you see lacking in current technology that would be what what are improvements you would like to see in that space? Yeah, um, yeah. So uh, so I'll try to address both of those, which is which is interesting because um, both of those areas are just like areas that like I am really interested in. And so uh, so for um, the Portland the Portland project that that project was the focus of that was to teach Black people how to. Uh, be uh, express their activism using technology and so uh and so i um it, it's a lot of the ar stuff that you see out and available if it's not like a speculative thing you know like if it's not like a, a test video that somebody made in after effects it's uh it's often going to be um mobile based or smartphone based just because like that's really the only way you could access it uh, and you could, there's web AR where you could access, you know, you don't have to download an app or there's app based stuff or social media stuff, but everything is really much smartphones at this point. VR is a little different, uh, just because you have the Oculus Quest and all that stuff, but like XR is really dependent on hardware. Um, and that's the, that's the limitation. And so, um, and so with the, with the, the, the George Floyd experience I did in Portland, I created the app. And so if you have an Android phone, you could sort of download the app and play around with it. Um, it's not available in the app store because I didn't want to pay for anything to get it on the app store. Uh, but if you have an iPhone, uh, they really made it difficult to share uh, apps and share AR experiences that aren't necessarily in their pipeline. Um, and I think it's because of, you know, they're getting away from the areas of like jailbreaking, if you ever like follow that. Um, you know, because of like the whole jailbreaking community, they've really like buckled down on, uh, on what you can do in terms of sharing, uh, uh, creations on app, on Apple's platforms. But, um, but with it, the way around that was I could use this as a teaching tool to, uh, to empower other creators to create these very things. And so as long as you have a computer, um, and you have just the desire to make something, you can make it, you can make something that you, that you own and that you control for your, like on your phone. Um, and so it, not only did I have the experience, but I also had like the walkthrough of what, what every single thing that I did to create this experience. And I just put it out there for free because, um, you know, the, uh, the, the stuff that I use were just available for free already. So as long as you have a computer and I do, you don't have to pay any money to create this experience and, and pick up some skills along the way. And so that was what that was. And then, um, and from there, I really started to explore like, okay, how do I make things more accessible and how do I make things more immersive, right? Um, when, when it comes to books, the problem with AR books and the problem that like, you know, people are starting to see is that in order for you to experience an AR book or anything AR, uh, you have to hold your phone with, in one hand and then you have to hold the book in another hand. And I don't know if you ever tried to read a book by just holding it with one hand and another hand behind your back. It's really, really difficult to hold it and also turn a page and also see all the stuff. God forbid you actually have a, I, you know, you have a graphic novel where you have a double page spread and, and you're trying to see the whole artwork. You can't do that, right? And so, uh, yes, 
AR has the power to add, you know, animation and, and bring the pages to life, but the the practical use of it isn't really a thing if you don't have three hands, right? If you don't have three arms and, and having one hand over it, it's really difficult. And so, uh, and so what I started looking at is how do you have, um, uh, how do you have an AR headset or a companion that you could utilize with a phone very much like a, a Google Cardboard, right? And so uh, Google Cardboard sort of made things more accessible because we had smartphones. It's not necessarily the case with, uh, with, uh, with AR, with augmented reality, uh, because it's, a, it's not stereoscopic. So you don't have sort of like the two eye holes. You actually have a full screen view and, you, uh, and there aren't really any headsets that you could, that you could utilize that for. And you can go with the HoloLens. The only problem is that you have to develop specifically for a HoloLens. And you have to develop specifically for these headsets. You're using the same tools, but you have to develop specifically for them. With smartphones, you can create an app for iPhone and iOS, and it goes to a variety of different devices. And so what I've been exploring is essentially, uh, this is a prototype, but like, like essentially creating a headset where you put, a, you put the phone in here, and then you put the headset on, and then you're able to, uh, because it's made out of cardboard, it's going to be lighter, it's going to be cheaper. And, uh, and because we all have $1,000 phones, right? Like iPhones have LiDAR at this point, right? So, uh, so you invest in the phone and you, you utilize iPhone's marketing and Samsung's marketing, and you essentially create a companion set that, uh, that allows you to have these comparable experiences. Um, and, and so it, it's, in many ways, like we're starting to see a trend with independent developers that go away from like the headset, you know, approach, the enterprise approach, you know, so that you don't have to buy thirty five hundred dollar headset. But um, but then if you if you do go that route, understand that like you're going to be inaccessible to uh, two people that you pro probably want to serve. And so uh, and so it, it's. Um, it's a, it's, you know, you know it, it, we're starting to see trends. We're starting to see Kickstarter projects and independent developers uh, addressing these problems. But, uh, but the industry in and of itself has really been focused on enterprise solutions. And, and so when you think of headsets, you think about like Apple glasses, which are going to cost three, $400. You think about, you know, the Unreal, which costs $500. You think about Magic Leap, which costs $3,000. Uh, HoloLens, which costs another $3,500. Um, you know, like who's going to afford that, right? Like, and then who's going to develop for it if you have to specifically make it for that that device, you know? And so, um, and so, tools like Unity and stuff like that make it easy. But, um, but you know, this is something I'm just I just been just putting together with duct taping and cardboard, right? Over the past like you know year or so, um, and I'm seeing that there's 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 hurdles you have to do to overcome like bringing these types of things to market, but um, but also that the market is really bare because there's so much focus on those enterprise solutions that nobody really cares about, you know, you walk into a company and say, hey, I want to do something for a smartphone with the, with the cardboard headset and people will laugh at you because they're like, that's not going to make any money. It will if you, if, you, if you sell a million copies of the headset, then it's like, you know, then it makes some money, you know, so, uh, so it, it's one of the current trends right now. Pretty passionate about it. <laughs> Yo, 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 this is Steve from Stuck on an Island. I definitely appreciate you taking the time to check out my work. Follow me on all the social nets. Be sure to check out my studio, Illtopia, on all the other platforms. And if you want to get some merch, check out shop.illtopia.com.